Hello everyone and welcome to the iView podcast brought to you by the Media and PR Committee of IIM Indore. To commemorate 25 years of excellence, the glorious Silver Jubilee Year of IIM Indore, we are on a mission to share our principles and fundamentals with the rest of the world. With this podcast series, we aim to invigorate thought leadership and bring nuggets of knowledge on business, finance, management and other such topics to the fore with one-on-one conversation with our amazing faculty members, notable alumni and the would-be leaders and managers, our participants from the flagship programs. We are thrilled to kickstart this remarkable journey with our respected director, Dr. Himanshu Rai. He has efficiently led I am Indore since he joined in December 2018 and under his guidance I am Indore has accomplished numerous milestones including triple crown accreditation from three international agencies AMBA AACSB and Equis Prior to this he has been associated as a professor at IIM Lucknow he has also been the dean at MISB Bocconi and a professor at SDA Bocconi in Milan he obtained his doctorate from IIM Ahmedabad, making seminal contributions in the field of negotiation and conflict resolution. His profile also includes corporate work experience at Tata Steel India. A multifaceted personality with an all-positive mindset, here we have with us Dr. Himanshu Rai. First of all, thank you, sir. I welcome you to the first episode of iView. And uh, I hope you're as excited as we are to have you on board with us. Thank you very much. And I'm equally excited to be here. Uh, Thank yes. you very much for inviting me. Yes, sir. So uh, you have more than two decades of experience in the uh, academic and practical aspects in the field of negotiation. So we will try to uncover a lot of your learnings from your enriched experiences. Sure. Uh, so the use of negotiation as a means of conflict management and dispute resolution has been around for a really long time and it can be dated back to our ancient scriptures. And uh, your unique perspective on incorporating Indian ethos in your pedagogy is very commendable and interesting as a student for us. So uh, can you shed some light on uh, what led to this inclination? Multiple things. You know, when you talk about uh, negotiation being a part of the experiences that are then in the scriptures, one of the things that I always remember is Krishna going to the court of Hastinapur and then negotiating. So while he started with an initial position saying that, why don't you give half the kingdom to the Pandavas? His walk away, the resistance point or the reservation point was only five villages. And that forms a crux of the negotiation. I've been fortunate enough that I come from a family where I was just surrounded by books. We had nothing except books all around me. And since my mother is a Sanskrit scholar, All the books were from the Sanskrit scriptures and Sanskrit literature. And therefore, very early on, I got hooked on Sanskrit literature. So when I decided to shift to academia, one of the things that was very clear in my mind was that I wanted to do my PhD in conflict management and negotiation. And since I had the added advantage of being interested in Sanskrit literature as well, I said, why not? When we have so much of wisdom coming from our ancient Indian scriptures, I should draw upon that particular wisdom. And Mahabharat, to me, you know, when you talk about negotiation, many people talk about different definitions of negotiation. They look at negotiation in personal life. They look at negotiation as something which is a give and take in the corporate world. But if you look at negotiation, essentially, at the core of it, it is psychologically the most matured way of resolving a conflict. And when you talk about conflicts, conflicts could be of multiple kinds. So you have intrapersonal conflict, which could be conflict within you. You can have interpersonal conflict, which is conflict among people. You can have intra-group conflict, because if you're negotiating as a part of a group, a collective, that collective could be your family, that collective could be organization, that collective could be your country, the conflict within that. And then you have the inter-group conflict, which is the conflict between two collectives. Now, if you look at the Mahabharata, The Mahabharata talks about all of these conflicts and the ramifications, including the emotional ones. And therefore, what better piece of literature to actually draw the lessons from? And thus, the moment I decided that I'm going to learn more about negotiation, dig deeper into the nuances of complex negotiation, it it was almost a truism that I had to look at the Sanskrit and the ancient Indian literature. Absolutely, sir. And uh, becoming more relevant in the current context with COVID-19, like uh, the entire functioning of the world has taken a complete 180 degree. So any particular management lesson from Vedas that you would like to share with our audience uh, that really helped you in uh, mitigating any particular conflict in the current scenario? 
See, multiple, but of course, I do not want this uh, particular show to become more of a professorial thing. But let me share one thing with you. When people were talking about COVID, of course, it was horrible, particularly the second wave and the kind of devastation that it lay on humanity is uh, was, was mind boggling. I just hope that uh, something like this we don't see in our lifetimes. But one of the things that I believe COVID did give us, and that's what I said, I look at COVID as. And that was COVID to me also signified creating opportunities for visioning, introspecting and discovering. And I think that is a lesson that comes from the Vedas. What is the kind of a vision that you have? And by that vision, what I mean is, what is the kind of universe that you would want to step into? What is that kind of a universe that you would want to be a part of? And I think the Vedic literature and the scriptures talk about that kind of a universe, which is more equitable, where people have freedom and where people have equality in the same measures. So that is the kind of a vision that we are talking about. Likewise, introspecting, trying to look inside yourself and then trying to see as to what is it that you're responsible for? Because a lot of people end up thinking that, hey, I'm just responsible for my life. But what I say and what the scriptures tell us is that the moment you breathe, the moment you start breathing, you have taken something from the universe and that is fresh air, which is not yours. And the very fact that you have taken something from the universe also means that you need to now contribute towards the universe. And as scriptures say exactly that. And finally, discovering who are you truly? Most people try to associate their identity with either their position, either their designation or the work that they do. But your true identity is something deeper. And I think that is what the Vedic literature tells us. So to me, one of the biggest lessons that I have drawn, particularly for the academic world, was creating this particular measure for wise or ethical leadership. Where the Vedic scripture said that you need to be good on two dimensions to be an ethical leader. One is called ability to see things. And ability to see things means something like what our rishis had, drashtwa iti rishi. The rishis were seers. They could see far. They could see beyond. They could see what was beyond this wall, what was outside this door, so on and so forth. And therefore, the ability to anticipate the consequences of the actions. You see, COVID is not the first pandemic and it's certainly not going to be the last one. And it's merely a consequence of the way that we have treated the environment. And that is what a leader does, anticipates the consequences of action in the short term, in the medium term and the long term. And more importantly, the second dimension that Vedic literature talks about, and this is particularly from the Yajur Ved, it's integrity. The Western philosophy defines integrity as walking the talk. But the Indian philosophy, the Vedic philosophy goes a step beyond and says Manasa Vacha Karmana, which means your thoughts, your words and your deeds, all three have to be in consonance. And only people who are high on both of these dimensions are going to be ethical leaders. They are going to be the drivers of tomorrow's universe. Absolutely, sir. I completely agree with you. And the acronym that you've come up with for COVID, it's very relevant to the current scenario. And I hope that the listeners and viewers that we have today with us, they will be uh, thinking about it. And uh, so you've offered business negotiation as a course to a very diverse set of participants here at IM Indore. And uh, you've also trained IS officers at Labasna Masuri. So I believe that there must be a lot of similarities and dissimilarities that you must have come across while uh, teaching both the set of participants. So uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? It's actually fascinating when I, uh, you know, I'm passionate about teaching yes. and it really doesn't matter who I'm teaching to and where I'm teaching. I, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable teaching uh, perhaps in a classroom, which is the state of the art classroom, and I'm equally comfortable teaching uh, under the shade of a tree. And therefore, even when I teach people from diverse backgrounds, so when I'm teaching PGP students or, or uh, the college students like you, then obviously there is one thing which comes out there, and that is that sheer curiosity to know more. And that is what drives me. That is what energizes me. And when I teach the phase five IS officers, phase five IS officers at Labasta, the IS officers who have worked for 25 to 27 years with the government, and therefore they have already done a lot of complex negotiations. They're already doing negotiations on behalf of the country or the state, depending on wherever it is that they are posted. But the one common thing between the two cohorts 
is this innate curiosity to learn. You'll be surprised that despite being at very senior positions, despite having all the experience in the world, when they come to the classroom, particularly from the negotiation classroom, they're equally curious to learn. They're equally curious to know more. And what separates the two is that when you bring examples of the negotiations that you have done, those are examples from your personal life. And when they bring examples, it's a combination of their personal life. It's a combination of the experiences that they have had while doing complex negotiations on behalf of the collective that they have represented, be it a district, be it a state, be it the country, so on and so forth. But the underlying lessons are always the same. So, for example, if I talk about the combination of substantive issues versus relationship issues, which means that the way you negotiate with people has to be always determined by how important are the substantive issues to you, which means issues related around money, and how important are relational issues to you, which means the need or the desire to keep a relationship with the other person. And when you talk about these fundamental issues, whether it is in this classroom of a postgraduate program or whether it is in that classroom of a labasna, people draw from their experiences, people draw from the past incidents in their life, and they come up with similar conclusions. So to me, it is absolutely delightful teaching both the cohorts. And the most important thing is the reason why I love to teach is because I get to learn. To me, a good teacher has to be an eternal learner. And one of the things that I've always lived by is a Socratic axiom which says that education and learning is the progressive realization of your own ignorance. The more you learn, the more you educate yourself, the more you realize how ignorant you are. And therefore, every time I teach a new class, every time I teach a new cohort, I also realize that there is so much more that I don't know because when I draw from their experiences, when I listen to their experiences, when I listen to what they did, I say, aha, I have those aha moments that yes, this is something that now I can bring into this classroom because this is new piece of information for me, new knowledge for me. So I think in many ways, there are, there are similar cohorts and in many ways, they bring completely different learnings to the classroom. Yes, sir. And drawing from your experiences, uh, all the sessions that we have with you for your course are very interesting. And uh, especially talking about your interest with yoga. And uh, in one of your previous interviews, you have also said that a true leader almost always has to be a yogi. <laughs> So uh, what, are the, uh, what are the characteristics or what are the learnings that we can have from yoga that can help us in polishing our leadership skills? Everything. Everything. You know, when you talk about yoga and when I talk about yoga, essentially yoga is the union of heart, mind and the soul. Yoga is the union of multiple things. Yoga karmasu koshlam. To do anything with the utmost of your capability is yoga. And therefore, the corollary also is that if you are a yogi, you will certainly do everything with the best of your capabilities. So, so to me, these two things go together. And which is why I say that a true leader is almost always a yogi, has to be a yogi. What does yoga actually do to you? Yoga helps you in taking a pause in your life. Yoga helps you in introspecting. Yoga helps you in defining a vision for yourself and determining a purpose for yourself. And all of these are necessarily attributes that a leader needs to have, no matter whatever it is that you're leading. You may be leading a very small collective or you may be leading this entire country. You need to have these attributes. And therefore, when people kind of try to relate yoga with a set of exercises, I have to keep telling them that, hey, that's just a part of yoga. The yoga is Ashtang yoga, yam, niyam, asan, pranayam, pratyahar, dhana, dhyan, samadhi. And when we talk about asan and pranayam, they are merely two of the eight limbs. When you talk about the yam and niyam, they tell you what kind of a life you need to lead. They tell you as to what kind of attributes do you need to have. They tell you as to how do you need to discipline yourself. And the more you start practicing this particular lifestyle and this particular set of exercises and the way you breathe, you know, this is, this is extremely important because a lot of people, they pay a lot of attention to their body, which they should, because I've always maintained that a healthy mind resides only in a healthy body. And therefore, unless you exercise those muscles, you are going to lose the control or they're never going to be as developed as they possibly could be to the best of their potential. But what is the essence of life? The essence of life is breathing. 
And a lot many people seem to understand that even breathing needs to be practiced. They believe that breathing comes naturally to us. No. Just the way that you have to learn how to walk well. You are actually trained that you have to walk in a straight line. You have to put one foot ahead of the other foot, so on and so forth. Likewise, there's a particular way of breathing. Now, the moment you start breathing like that, the moment you have a control over your breath, you simultaneously also get a control over your thought process. And I think that is the biggest attribute that a leader leads. So I would say that everything that you do as a part of yoga actually adds to you becoming a better and a better leader. Yes, sir. So we also have yoga workshops in our curriculum. And another interesting thing for our audience to know would be about the Himalayan Outbound Program. And you being somebody who has always been interested in trekking, I would like to ask you how being in touch with your spiritual side, with Himalayas as your spiritual abode, has helped you in enhancing your leadership qualities. You know, that's a question which probably requires a day worth of an answer <laughs> because there, there's so much I've learned from my Himalayas and I always call them my Himalayas. Some people actually take a little bit of an exception to it that way. Hey, they can't be your Himalayas, but I, I, I have that affection with them. Why? Because Himalayas came into my life when I was going through a personal problem. And when I went to the Himalayas for the first trek, and I was fortunate enough to be trained by Bachendri Pal, the first Indian woman to climb Mount Everest, I thought I had found my home. I thought I found my true home and the Himalayas came to my rescue and got me out of that pickle that I was in, mentally speaking. And thereafter, I have returned to the Himalayas every time I have to make a critical decision of my life. Every time I think I'm in a problem, every time I think I need answers. And therefore, Himalayas mean a lot more to me than anything else. But just talking about some specific lessons that I've learned from my Himalayas early on, I still remember that I was, I was doing this expedition and uh, this was the final expedition. So which means that we were at the advanced base camp and then we had to actually do the peak. And when we do so, we actually start at about 1, 1 30 in the night. Uh, that, that's, that's the ideal time because you want to reach the peak and come back before the sun rises. That's the best time uh, to, to attempt a summit. And I got, off, got out of my tent and I looked at the peak and I gave up because it was just too far. It was just too technical. And I told my guide that uh, I can't do this. And the guide said, oh, well, now that we are awake, uh, you know, no point uh, going back to the tent because we won't get sleep. So why don't we walk uh, for some time and then we'll come back. And I said, yeah, sounds like a good idea. At least we'll get to see some view. It was a starry night. And therefore we started walking. We walked for about half an hour. And then the guide turned back to me and said, uh, so what do you think, Hamanshu? Shall we go back? You know, I look back and I realized how far we had come from the advanced base camp. And then I looked back at the peak and then suddenly that peak did not look so daunting. It did not look so tough. And then we continued our walk. I said, no, let's continue. And we did the summit. The lesson that I learned was that every time you think that something is impossible or something is just too tough, look back at whatever you have achieved till that point of time in your life. And I'm sure that you have achieved a lot, no matter what age you are in. The very fact that we have lived a certain number of years is a testimony of the fact that we have come through the trials and the tribulations of life. And once you look at that, once you draw inspiration from your inner resources, and then you look back at the target again, the target will not seem to be that tough. So that was one of the big lessons that I learned. Another lesson that I learned was how to handle failure. So again, this was another expedition that we were doing. And this was a solo expedition. Solo expedition in the sense that I was the only one who was paying. But we had a support <laughs> staff of uh, six people. You need all of that to, to do a technical uh, climb. And I remember this was the third or the fourth day. And I made a wrong decision. So we do something called load ferrying, which means... We climb high, but we sleep low. So for example, in day one, we'll take some stuff up, drop it there, and then we'll come down and then sleep here. Day two, we'll go there. Day three, we'll go to the next one, drop the stuff there and come back to the, to the previous base camp, so on and so forth. And one day I thought that, hey, we've done already two or three uh, great camps with the load ferrying. So this, this time we don't need it. We didn't come back. We went up, we put the stuff there and we stayed. And the next day, the following day, three, four of us had pulmonary edema, which means that there was water inside our lungs. And then we had to make a decision. I was tempted because I could see the peak very close to me. I was tempted to still make the attempt. But I still remember my guide who 
एंड विच इज वाई आई नेवर एवर इक्वेट लिटरेसी विद एजुकेशन वी मेक दैट मिस्टेक वेरी ऑफन वी बिलीव दैट द नंबर ऑफ ईयर्स दैट यू स्पेंट इन स्कूल tells you as to how educated you are this person had not spent many years in the school in fact he had spent hardly any but this guy told me sir ye pahad kahin nahi jane wala ye agle saal bhi yahi rahega and i learned a big lesson that don't get so carried away by this superficial concept of success that you need to do this peak that you completely forget as to what were you there in the first place for and therefore i made a decision immediately to come back and of course conquered that peak the following year but the, what i learned was that simply because you have failed in one or two attempts simply because you have failed in one or two initiatives that does not mean that you have become a failure you become a failure only if you stop trying and therefore you need to have that grit inside you you need to have that perseverance inside you to get up again after a failed attempt and do it but do draw your lessons from whatever it is that you have failed in uh, another thing that i would like to talk to you about is your love for books so uh, we came to know that your house is full of around 5000 books so uh, <laughs> for our audience today would you like to share our top 3 recommendations that you would give of your all time favorite books so oh, that that's a tough one the top is 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 not uh, tough at all it's it's the gita it's a bhagavad gita and uh, bhagavad gita and also the mahabharat and mahabharat simply because bhagavad gita uh, is a part of the mahabharat yes, and mahabharat is because mahabharat is equally fascinating mahabharat is as fascinating as a scripture from where you can draw lessons from as it is if you look purely at the story because it is itihas it's history it talks about a, a historical event and therefore there's a lot of learning that you can draw from it and gita of course i mean i can as i said i can spend days talking about gita so that would be uh, my number 1 number 2 now this is a tough one because if i look at it from a book which has helped me in exploring myself i would say siddharth by herman hess a german author now this is the protagonist this is the story of a protagonist uh, called siddharth who goes out to actually discover himself and then the kind of people that he meets and the kind of experiences that he has actually take you to a, a journey uh, inside your own self and therefore to me this book is something that actually resonates with the kind of experience that we have and with the kind of those questions that we try to answer most of our lives as to who are we and why are we whatever it is that we are and i think siddharth helps you in exploring that question along with the story of the protagonist and at the same time if you are looking to 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 simply draw happiness from life i would say everything written by pg woodhouse so that again i would put at uh, number 2 itself because every time i read a pg woodhouse the way pg woodhouse writes i wish i could write that way the narrative is so beautiful that i think pg woodhouse i've always read the smile on my face you would never laugh you would never guff out loud but you would always have this constant smile and that was the beauty of the pen that pg woodhouse held so th- those would be uh, my number 2 and number 3 again a very difficult one because i'm trying to look at what genre should i actually be suggesting but i would go absolutely the other way and i would talk about another favorite author of mine and i would say everything written by wilbur smith and i say that because it is through the writings of wilbur smith that i have discovered africa that's the only continent that i've never been to but i think i know africa more than many people because i have read everything that wilbur smith has written and although it's fiction wilbur smith does his homework and he writes about africa as if africa actually lives in his soul so to me i would say these three uh lastly i would like to talk about uh, how i am indore has completed 25 glorious years and our institute has collected various accolades along the way uh, uh we have we are we have been contextually relevant and world class and socially conscious institution throughout this entire journey so uh, what are your views about it and what do you think lies ahead for i am indore what a brilliant uh, 25 years uh, this has been for i am indore you know starting in 1996 with its first batch joining in 1998 graduating in 2000 
to the new programs and one program which for which we were the forerunners we have been the forerunners and i'm particularly proud of that program the integrated program in management which came in 2011 and also obviously we we are celebrating 10 years of uh, the integrated program in management i think i'm in dot has come a long way i'm in dot has come a long way in the sense that it always had the potential and now you can see that it is reaching its potential if i talk about this journey of 2 uh, years and 8 months uh, that i've uh, spent over here what i've seen is this incredible talent that our students have the incredible sense of curiosity the incredible sense of doing something for the world and then the immense love for academics and research that our faculty members given and they come with the immense amount of pride that our officers and staff take in whatever it is that we are doing and the way our alumni are coming out right now and making sure that i am in the or stays in the journey to excellence that it has actually embarked upon to me the biggest sense of satisfaction i'm of course you you have mentioned the milestones already getting the triple crown accreditation of amba aacsb and equis they are but the milestones they they put us in the rank of the top 100 uh, business institutions in the world only the second one in india to do so we are consistently in in our uh, top 10 rankings uh, in our country in top 5 in most of the other rankings if you look at the world rankings they rank us at top 5 uh, in india we are in the ft 100 so on and so forth but all of these are milestones what i take pride is the fact that our students actually want to do more they want to participate in nation building and i think this is the direction that i am indor has taken in the last 2 3 years and this is the direction that i am indor will take and that is at i am indor we will strive to create responsible leaders responsible leaders who make equitable decisions responsible leaders who make inclusive decisions responsible leaders who create a beautiful world which actually allows everyone to come up to their true potential at i am indor we will try to solve the problems of the community be it the community around us be it the city be it the state be it this country be it this uh, world and i think in future i believe i am indor will be known as the institution which actually changed the way the world thought which actually changed the way india actually stepped up to become one of the forces in the world to reckon with and likewise i am indor will become one of the top global business schools in the world which is known not just for business education but for creating a certain kind of a thought process so thank you sir for uh, introducing us uh, to a unique perspective about leadership and management skills and sharing with us your nuggets of knowledge i believe that uh, our audience enjoyed this insightful conversation as much as i did Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. I enjoyed this conversation as much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.